Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, Broke, the Game, What Would You Do? This webinar is being co-hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty and the Network of Jewish Human Service Agencies. We're pleased to bring you all together for a special program to learn about a groundbreaking new game that educates people about the realities of poverty in the United States. Broke the Game simulates the stress and difficulty of attempting to overcome poverty with a simple setup. This game forces players to challenge their preconceived ideas about poverty and those experiencing it. We are fortunate today that we will hear from the creator of the game about why she was inspired to, to build this game and colleagues and funders will share their impressions of the experience they had playing this, um, playing Broke the Game. And now I'm pleased to introduce Ruben Rotman, the president and CEO of Na Network of Jewish Human Service Agencies to frame the session and introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Ruben. Thanks so much, Tamar, and thank you all for joining us today. This is an unusual webinar we appreciate because this is a, an opportunity to dig into the dynamics behind poverty um, and to do so through the structure of play, of a game not something we normally think about. We have the great fortune to be able to have a conversation with the creator, the visionary who helped to design and, and get this game um, established and, and out in the world. Uh, and to also, we're gonna be giving each of you an opportunity to actually play or simulate a play of the game. And we're gonna hear from colleagues those who represent different voices in the Jewish community around um, their experiences having had the opportunity to play the game. So we want to begin today, and of course, we will absolutely leave time for questions. I encourage you to put questions in the Q&A box, um, and we will do our best to leave time at the end of the webinar to take your questions. But for the beginning, I wanted to facilitate a bit of a conversation with my good friend and colleague, Dana Gold. Dana is the COO, the Chief Operating Officer at JFCS in Pittsburgh. And Dana developed this game several years back, but um, it's been uh, sort of updated more recently. Um, and so we have the opportunity to talk with Dana and to learn a bit about her and about the game. So to begin this, Dana, um, I'd like to ask you first to tell us a bit about yourself um, and what led you to the concept of developing this game. Well, it's great to have everybody here today and I'm grateful to be able to share with you really the work of my life. Um, throughout my career, I have been a serial nonprofit developer, entrepreneur, so to speak. And in those instances of creating programs and organizations that support people who struggle with poverty, I really felt that I was perpetuating in some ways the systems that support people being trapped and ensnared in a um, cycle of poverty. So, you know, I, as many people who work for nonprofits uh, with the homeless or with those who struggle with a variety of problems are asked every Thanksgiving to show up at uh, different groups or different congregations and give a speech, talk about the work of um, supporting uh, people who are on the streets or whatever the work it is that we do. Um, I was always met with, you know, very warm reception and the desire to be supportive either through a check or with words or but what I recognized as I continued to do this was that it further created a gulf between myself and the people who wanted to help and it also created a larger gap between the people who were actually struggling with poverty and the people who could actually help solve the problem of poverty so I would, you know, go into the congregations and get a check and walk back out. But at one point in time, it was just like, you know, I need to do something different. I need to make this more visceral. I need to help people really feel what it feels like to be in the real situation of struggling to overcome poverty. 
so that they understand that this isn't an individual failing of someone who just didn't work hard enough or who made bad decisions. It, it's a system that exists that we need to work together to overcome. And so the very first time when I made the game, I was teaching a institute and I, I, I was like, okay, I pulled out the big piece of butcher block paper and got a toilet paper roll and was making little circles and a big spiral. And then I swiped my kids' uh, shoots and ladders movers, you know, the little kids with the pigtails and the mm -hmm. Afro and cute little striped shirt and um, put them in what I, at the time, it was called the Department of Public Assistance. And, you know, so the people at this institute started interacting with the game and they didn't at the end of it say to me, oh, that's nice that you do such good work. They were like, this needs to change. So there was an absolute different response from people engaging in the situations and making choices in real situations um, than there was to me just coming and telling a story, right? Or sharing statistics. Mm -hmm. There was a will to change the system that didn't exist any other way that I, that I could see. So that's how Broke started. Um, and you know, it's very important for people to know all the situations in the game are real. These are not things that I made up. These are real experiences of real people so that the individuals who play it get that opportunity to you know, deal with real life. So, so tell, tell us a bit about that more. How did you come up with the characters that are in the game? So there are six different characters, so to speak, in the game. And they all represent a different segment of the US population who struggles with poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, one of, the one of the characters is a farmer. So the largest percentage of people in poverty in the United States are rural individuals who farm or fish or do forestry. And then we also have uh, people who are senior citizens, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the characters is a senior citizen, someone who's struggling with a limited income. Uh, there's someone else, uh, one of the growing aspects of poverty in the United States are people who are living in the suburbs. Um, recently, you know, relationship challenges, lack of uh, income underwater with property, that's another character. So they're all representing different segments of the US population that struggles with poverty. The largest percentage of people who struggle with poverty in the United States are children under the age of 18. And so um, some of the characters in the game have children and have to make very difficult decisions about sending their kids to uh, school trips or letting them play football or, you know, any number of things that real people struggle with providing for their children in ways that uh, keep their kids safe and engaged and a part of a part of uh, a positive future for themselves and their family. So already in sharing a bit about the characters in the game and in sharing the data in terms of percentage of populations that struggle with poverty, you're already beginning to address some myths and stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So I'm certain that that's a goal for the game. Could you talk with us a bit about your goals for this game? What do you hope people get out of the experience of interacting with the game? What, you know, why did you want to put this out there on the market? So first of all, we have to say on the market, it's free. <laughs> so right. the app is free, the <laughs> book is free. The game, the board game itself is sold at cost because we don't want anybody's experience to be limited uh, by, uh, and I don't want to make money off of poverty. By access. So, yeah. Right. Um, but what I really hope for the game is that I, I hope that what years of gameplay has taught me is that individuals walk away from this game saying, I have more empathy. I had no idea that it was this hard. I didn't know that internal feeling. And so 
if we can create empathy for the people who are struggling mightily every day to try to overcome the circumstances in which they find themselves, mm -hmm. if we can create empathy for that, then we can begin the process of applying that empathy to the work that we do, to the way that we vote, to where we give our money. And as funders and people who work in philanthropy, how we make decisions about where we place our talents, skills, strength, investment, so that it is not just perpetuating a system that's broken or putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. Mm -hmm. We can educate ourselves and understand the limitations of um, the systems that we have created that support people in poverty. We can do better than this. And so really what I want is system change. So that's Thank the goal. You. Thank you. So talk to us a bit about how the game has been used since its development. Um, what types of players have engaged with the game? Uh, it sounds like a very strong educational tool. So what kinds of audiences have been exposed to this? So through the years, um, it's been people who are congregation members. It's been volunteers and programs. It's been high school students, teachers, lawyers, and police officers. We've had a wide variety of people in a lot of different professions who interact with uh, people who struggle with poverty from emergency room physicians, right, to mm -hmm. uh, graduate mm -hmm. students preparing themselves with their master's degrees. So it's been played, you know, from universities all the way down to different classrooms and, and congregational basements. <laughs> so it, it's provi provided the same empathetic response, mm -hmm. no matter where you go. Now, interestingly enough, some people hate this game. Right. And I, I understand gonna, it. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, have any of the reactions, what have been some of the reactions to the experience of playing the game? And have any of them surprised you? So some of the reason why people don't like the game is because they want to argue with it. You know, um, part of what we have from the point of view of an academic exercise of interacting with a game is we want to argue with the situations. We want to argue with the limitations because the, the game actually forces you to make one of two choices. And there's a reason for that. Partially because what happens to people's brains has been studied Princeton and other places when poverty becomes just a one aspect of the pressure surrounding an individual is their ability to process cognitively decreases. Mm -hmm. It's like tunnel vision. Right. I call it poverty brain. Yep. But that, that frozen, like deer in the headlights, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to decide. I'm Paralyzed. all my yep. energy. Right. So um, people don't like that feeling. Right. And they also think that they would make better decisions. They would have somehow uh, the ability to escape that problem of uh, you know poverty brain. Mm -hmm. uh, so they that's that's difficult. The other thing is it's stressful. The game, even though there are elements of fun and chance and embarrassed laughter, it's a stressful game, and that was done on purpose because you want people to feel that anxiety and stress that comes from having to deal on a daily basis with poverty. Yeah. Um, and then one of the other really wonderful things about the game is when you're playing with people, you have no idea what their background is. You know, you're just looking at a bunch of other people who are in the same class or are all teachers, but you don't know who grew up in poverty. You also don't know who's living in poverty. And so when you're sitting at a table interacting with other people, the person in the room who has the biggest experience with poverty is the one who is um, the expert. And so there's a lot of feeling of validation of mm -hmm. their experience and it's it's upheld in in that in that learning environment which is very powerful yeah 
All right. So I think that we've um, enticed and probably um, created a bit of what's going on here with this game already. <laughs> um, so I think this is a perfect segue. Um, I want to tell you what we want to shift into now, having learned a bit about the origins of the game, populations is being used with the rationale and the goals for the game is to actually have you see the game and experiencing it yourselves, I think will help to put um, put this all in perspective for you. Know, for you. So Dana is going to um, have us see the game itself and she's gonna pose some questions and I'll let her facilitate that. But after that, she's gonna have a conversation with um, three colleagues who had the opportunity to play the game in advance. Um, and each of them, we, we reached out to look for, uh, again, different personas, different personalities, so to speak, who operate in our Jewish Funders Network, National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty World. Um, and so we are most fortunate that we have Mara Moss with us, who is a, uh, a um, lay leader, a board member, of the Jewish Women's Foundation in Detroit. She's also a board member of the Jewish Family Service of Detroit. So she's here representing both a lay leader of a direct service agency, a board member of an agency that provides services for persons living with poverty, as well as representing uh, the board of a private foundation that makes grants. We have Brian Rothenberg, who is uh, the senior planning associate with the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Detroit involved in community planning and agency relations. Again, federations play a critical role in helping to develop with agencies responses to address poverty um, and also helping to make decisions around funding. Um, and we also have Courtney Owen, who is the director of individual and family services at Jewish Family, JFCS of Greater Philadelphia. Courtney is a licensed clinical social worker and um, works both with individuals in poverty and provides supervision to other social workers who work with individuals in poverty. Uh, and so after Dana shares with all of us the game and has us uh, engage with some of the questions, um, Dana's going to have a conversation with Mara, Brian, and Courtney, each of whom played the game previously. Um, and we'll continue the, the session after that. Broke the Game has two different ways to engage with it. There is the app. This is a new development. Uh, Broke would not look the way it looks at this point or exist as an app without the support of a partnership that I've developed with Carnegie Mellon University's Entertainment Technology Center. They loved the idea. They didn't mind my butcher block, block paper and the little circles. Um, they could see past that and see the power of the game. So the Entertainment Technology Center has become a great laboratory for developing not only the uh, structure of the game and you know, the elements of chance and how many circles in between different things and all the math that goes into a game, if you didn't know there was math. But they were also the ones who were able to take the game and help. I, would, I worked with a team to develop the app and the app was just released this past July. So it's new, it's a first iteration and it gives people the opportunity to uh, do this individually. So to just interact with your phone in a way that you're getting text messages from your sister or you're getting an email from your landlord and having to make choices in that situation and to watch either your bank balance go up or down, that's that little piggy bank, or your circle of friends leave or stay the same depending on the decisions that you make that affect your relationships as well. And then of course, there's also the news you know how the news <laughs> impacts all of us. Well, in the game also, when there are cuts in transportation or food stamps or any other thing, that also comes through your phone and shows you how it impacts your bank balance as well. 
So there's all those different aspects happening to you, coming to you through that very personal interaction that you have with your personal device, the phone. But the board game itself looks very different. <clears throat> the board game is a spiral. It allows people to each have their own character and to take turns pulling a card that has a situation in it and one or two choices. After everyone makes a choice, the card is flipped, the results are, are, are revealed, and then that pushes you further into the spiral of poverty or pulls you back out towards that green circle of financial stability. There are also other elements of the game where you have privileges that are called star cards and those privileges reflect race privilege, gender privilege, language privilege, all these different uh, privileges that we have that may be seen or unseen abilities that are uh, in not visible or visible, all those different kinds of things are used in your star cards, which are assets that you get to use throughout the game in order to try to achieve financial stability. And as you can see on the game, everyone starts someplace differently. There's not just one start space because everyone enters poverty at different places in different ways. For instance, the person closest to financial stability on this game board you can see is red. And that red character is actually a college graduate and uh, newly, newly, uh, newly minted with their you know, bachelor's degree. Um, and then as you go further into the spiral, you can see the orange character. That orange character, as you can see on the game board, every single person has a different explanation of who they are when they're interacting with the game. The person who is orange is someone who has been recently divorced and without any child support and is underwater with their home. The yellow character is a senior citizen who's further in the, in, into the spiral. And then you come to the green character who's a farmer um, and has a spouse and children. The blue character is uh, a single adult with children who is living in an urban environment and is also undocumented. And then the purple character is someone who struggles with not having permanent housing and also struggles with um, mental health challenges. So in this situation, what we're going to do today is that we're going to be the green character, who we are. And I'm going to just read to you very quickly who, you know, the kind of broad strokes of who you would be in this game as you're making decisions. So keep this in mind because the next thing we're going to do is actually draw a card and make a decision. I'm gonna read a situation and you're gonna make a decision based on you as someone who is working the land as a farmer. So who are you? You are in your early thirties and you're married. You have three children, one who's in preschool, one who's in elementary school and one who's in middle school. As your occupation, you are a farmer and your spouse works part-time at a minimum wage job. You have a trade school education. You live in a rural environment in a rent to own. So you don't actually own your land, but you're renting it to be able to farm it. And then your challenges are that you have very hard work, physically challenging, challenging. you have a fluctuating income, and you have, and your work is mostly very seasonal. So that's who you are, okay? So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna take one of our situation cards here and we're going to uh, just choose one as if it's my turn and I'm gonna read the situation to you and you are going to make one of two choices. So. After I read the situation and read the two choices, you're gonna just, you know, you can put it in the chat if you'd like and choice one or choice two, and we'll see where everybody, everybody lands. So in this situation, you are in a car accident and the police are called. Well, 
you don't have insurance. So you, they write you a thousand dollar citation because of that. So if you pay the citation, if you pay the thousand dollars, you are gonna have a very difficult time paying the rest of your bills for the month. So choice one, pay your bills. Choice two, pay the citation. So which would you do? And then one of the reasons in the game, what we try to do is we, um, we make that anonymous because we do find that, uh, you know, group think and peer pressure does play a, a role in how people make decisions. So if, if we just look at the chat really quickly, most people chose number one, mm -hmm. okay? Yep. So choice number one, here's the result. There is now a warrant for your arrest. If you are stopped again, you'll be taken to jail. Not so good, huh? If you had chosen number two, you aren't in trouble with the law, but you are behind on your bills. So in each of these situations, there's a different penalty associated with it. So with result one, you would move into the spiral three spaces, okay? And if you had made choice two, you would be moving into the spiral one space. So you can see the different impact of your decisions based on where you land on the board. We're gonna do one more. Okay. Your son is diagnosed with autism. Even though he is three, he still isn't using the toilet. You can't find an affordable childcare center that will take him due to his toileting issues. Choice one, have your spouse quit work and stay home with your son. The lost income will make things even more difficult, but he will have good care. So choice two, keep your job, find him an unlicensed daycare in someone's home. He won't get any specialized care, but at least you've maintained your income. A few so now we have a wider variety of responses. Uh-huh, yep. Okay, so this is a little bit more difficult. Before I give you the result, I want you to just do a little bit of a check with yourself. So how did that feel? Right? This is your child. They're challenged. Can you feel a sense of stress or tension, just even a little tiny bit in this imaginary world? So now we have to wait for the response, right? Result one, your income loss makes you eligible for subsidies for your son, but you can't pay your bills. Move into the circle, four spaces. Result two, you can keep your job, but without specialized care, your son's condition will probably stay the same. Move into the spiral, two spaces. So there's also an element here of just the mounting stress and tension that occurs with repeated demands on making high stakes decisions. Some of them may not feel very high stakes, like whether or not to pay your library fine, that may not seem very high stakes, but what happens is you continually answer these questions and have these demands put on you, it becomes more and more stressful. Uh, that's part of the, what ha is how the game was designed to have that accumulating stress and tension. So what we're gonna do now is I'd like to bring Mara and Courtney back and Brian, bring everybody back together. Thank you all for um, taking a, a, a little bit of a spin with the online game, with the app. And I just wanted to first start out with a, a, just a little bit of an introduction. You know, I met 
Courtney, what, a month ago mm -hmm. online, I, you were interested in the game and interested in um, having a little bit of an introduction to that game. So uh, Courtney had this great experience with poverty and working as a social worker with a nice career, depth of understanding of poverty. So you were kind enough to take the game to your staff. Mm -hmm. And you had 14 people play together and, and have a, a, a kind of a, the experience with professionals to, uh, to interact with broke. And the quote that you sent me that I thought was just so powerful is sitting here in front of us. You know, how can we make changes to systems that impact poverty if we don't understand what those experiencing poverty are actually going through? and the choices they're faced with. Broke helps us to better understand the context for those decisions and therefore why those choices are made. I, I wonder, Courtney, if we could just start with you and then we'll move to Mara and Brian. Um, what are some of the things that the people, I mean, you've got a professional staff, they've got a lot of experience. What was their uh, interaction with Broke like? What did they come away with? Sure. Um, so we actually did it on a Zoom call and we broke into breakout rooms and one person played on the phone and then um, they all decided as a group like which direction they would go. Um, and it was interesting. Everybody had a different character and everybody kind of made different decisions. Um, I think a lot of the things that that the game offers, you know, social workers who are working with individuals living in poverty already sort of know, but the game really like just kind of brings you a new perspective really is thought provoking and it makes you kind of like stop in your tracks for a second and think okay what are the clients who are sitting across my desk or now in my zoom room um, really faced with on a day-to-day -day basis and sometimes when we look at things so concretely like the decision between paying a bill or um, you know helping out a friend seem not as in, um, as involved as they might be for the person um, and not really realizing sometimes the value of those relationships and how they can also have um, significant impact on somebody's life. And so maybe the money at times might not be as valuable as a relationship. So when you're faced with a decision of, do I you know, increase my bank account or do I increase the number of people in my circle for somebody who those are the only two options, it's really challenging. Um, and, and I like the term, poverty brain. And I think in our group, we had a lot of conversation around that. And how do we help somebody who is, who is trying to think past today to start planning long term and to see the value in planning long term when you can't even think beyond the day. And that's really challenging. Um, you know, and another thing that that came up, I think, for me, was really that how do we know if what we're doing is really empowering versus disempowering somebody? Um, I think there are times when people come to us and they ask us to kind of like do for them or, you know, help them do something and we want to help create independence. But when is that creating independence and being empowering and when is it just not helping somebody who really is like, I just need this right now to get to the next step. Um, and so it really made me think that think more in, de uh, in depth about that and, and invoke conversation with my team around that. Um, but I, I will tell you, one of the groups came back and one of the things they said was we did, we decided upfront that we were going to make all the right decisions in the game. Um, and at the end, they, they felt so just sort of defeated because the outcome was not what they wanted it to be. Um, and then it also just brought up the conversation of what's the right decision? What's the right choice? Um, and I think for someone living in poverty, the right choice is, is what the benefit is in that moment. And that might not always be the right choice for the long term. Um, and, and I, I think it's really important to understand all of the complexities that people are faced with to be able to start making changes in the way we work with um, and put policies in place around those dealing with poverty. Wow, well, thank you, Courtney. I mean, mm -hmm. as uh, I, that's what I hope mm -hmm. the kind of conversations would occur from uh, playing the game. 
So Mara, I'm going to jump to you now. I'm, I'm going to ask a little bit from your perspective, you know, um, what were your reactions? What was, what, what came up for you? What were the aha moments um, as well, you interacted? I had some, I, I thought the game was so interesting and I played it as a few different people and I had different responses. So the, I first played it as a single parent and then I played it as um, homeless. And in both results, I was unable to get myself out of, out of poverty and moved further into this spiral. I have a 13 year old daughter who I said, try your hand at this game. And she was able to get out of poverty at a much, <laughs> much quicker than I was. But what I thought was so, so interesting in addition to um, just having a different perspective on it was that like, when we just played that game and we had two, you had two different choices either to pay a thousand dollars for the citation or not. And most people are, I chose one and you seem that paying your bills seem to be an obvious or to somebody that's not, doesn't have poverty brain and isn't involved in, isn't in that cycle. But then when you get to choice, the second question, you start thinking already a little bit differently because you're thinking to yourself, well, in question one, I thought I knew what the right answer was, but maybe I wasn't coming at it from quite the right angle. Now I'm thinking about and, and really being in that situation, what would I really do? And I think that part of the interesting part of the game is your thought process changes as you move throughout the game. Um, another th thing that I thought was very interesting and Courtney mentioned it as well, is the feeling of being defeated. So in the, in the choice, you just, in the choice of a single parent, um, in one of the situations, your roof was leaking and you could either stay in a separate bedroom with your kids, you had three kids, you're in your early thirties while the roof leaks. And then a neighbor calls you or texts you as it is on the app. And she says, um, she says, hey, I know somebody that can fix your roof for free or we'll fix it, don't worry about it. And then it's one less thing you have to worry about. So I said, no, we're fine. We'll figure it out, we'll take care of it. And I didn't wanna have to, oh, that person anything I didn't feel like I had that close of a relationship with the person that offered me the roof but really that was an incorrect answer because it pushed me back even farther because now I had to find a way to fix my roof in addition to buying groceries and going to work and then so I realized that wasn't the right answer and I also saw throughout the game that just sort of continuously swallowing your pride is a big part of poverty brain like all right, fix my roof. I need it done more than I need my pride to not have it done. And I think that as a psychological component, that's so important. Um, we talk about creating empathy and in different, Dana, you mentioned in different contexts that you've used it in. One of the things, one of the other hats that I wear in the community is I'm a co-chair for the legal referral service at Jewish Family Service. And what we do is we provide our clients with legal assistance. They already have to be clients. It's not, you can't call a, a hotline, but if you're, um, you know, maybe you need a an attorney to help you to declare bankruptcy before you can get to the other issues on your plate, especially if you have mental illness or if you're being abused and you need a family law attorney. And we're trying to teach some of the attorneys empathy because it's such a different person that comes into your office. Just the fact that you're an attorney and they're in the circle of poverty, they freeze up when they come into an attorney's office. Okay, sir, what can I do? How do I fill out this form? And just teaching that attorney that they're not coming into your office with the same perspective as the majority of their clients gives that attorney more empathy in dealing with that client and also more likely success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I think how we um, help and how we can slow things down, calm things down, surround people with enough confidence, they can think creatively, yeah. but you have to calm the whole circumstance down so that creativity and problem solving just, you know, pops back up again. But there needs to be the appropriate environment um, where you're not having all these competing priorities. That was another thing that was brought up, I thought that was very interesting is 
how much anxiety was created just in waiting for an answer, even though the answer was coming in moments. Imagine how, how it feels when you're waiting weeks for you know, a reply from the lawyer, right? Or so, so let's jump down with Brian and, and give you a chance to, to talk about from your perspective, Brian, and I know you didn't get a, a very a long chance to play different characters or anything, but you know, what was your what was your initial impression and thoughts? It's very discouraging. Let's <laughs> yeah. begin with that. Um, I mean, the, the game moves quickly enough that you do reach a cadence and, and the cadence in and of itself is frustrating that, you know, you, you address one issue, whether you did it well or not well, the next thing hits, you know, you, so, you know, you get a message through the messaging app and then as soon as you've answered that and dealt with it, so now you have a news item that dropped your bank account more and then you get an email and, and it, it's the cadence can be um, anxiety driving also. Um, I know there was, I heard on both sides, the, the conversation about whether you, you're trying to make the right decisions, you know, you go and decide, I'm going to make all the right decisions. So there are some times when I think from a, coming from a background where my parents taught me about money and things like that. So like, for example, when some, when a friend reached out in the app, um, offering to go in on lottery tickets, well, I know that the right answer is to not buy lottery tickets. Okay. So I made that choice, but some of them aren't clear right now. I'm looking at an email from the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, that I have an overdue fine. And my choice is don't pay fine, but pay monthly bills or pay fine, but don't pay monthly bills. Now I can naturally assume that the consequences in this app are going to be either my utilities are shut off and that's going to cost money, or I'm not going to be able to drive to my job or something like that. There's no right answer, but so it, so, and sometimes there's there's maybe a more clear, correct path forward, but I, I don't know what to do. How am I supposed to answer that email? Am I supposed to pay? I, I don't know, you know. And and so inevitably, okay. And then and then there's also the question of sometimes there's not such a clear right or wrong answer, but one of the negative consequences is you lose people in your circle. So um, a kid asked me to pay. One of my kids asked me to pay the athletic fee. So I said no. Well, that kid left my circle, you know. <laughs> Well, okay, now my kid isn't talking to me. I, like, so it, it's, it doesn't actually have real life consequences. It's an app, it's a game, but that could have real life consequences when you walk in your front door, you know, and, you know, and the kids won't talk to you because you can't pay for something that they feel is reasonable to pay for. So I'm at the Federation in Detroit and we do, uh, I'm, I'm in, in the planning and agency relations and we do a lot of the community needs assessments and population studies. So I deal with a lot of this from the data perspective the day-to-day -day actual on the ground work, I face less. Those are our partner agencies like Jewish Family Service, um, among others, that um, see clients who have these poverty related needs and they have some safety net funds available to help, but it's not gonna necessarily solve the problem. So um, I, I think it was realistic. I think it was interesting. Um, I was entertained by in the chat function there were typos and then they'd fix the typos. I thought that was a cute feature, um, but it, it it does force a different perspective and it's um, it's engaging in that way too. So um, I thought I, I had a lot of thoughts even in the short amount of time that I was able to interact with the game. Thank you, Brian. That's really 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 helpful. I, I do think that um, just understanding the stress helps inform how we design programs, how we intervene, you know, that that stress, that tension, that pressure, that mounting, you know, how do we create a food pantry that's only open once a month in a basement somewhere? You know, does, is that helpful? Well, yeah, we're providing food, but how do I find it? Is it on a bus route? it's open only from five to eight. What if I, you know, those kinds of questions that we bring into it, we create barriers that we're not aware of when we try to offer help lots of times. Just to add on that vein, I think the app also just sort of demonstrates certain things that I might not have known as a coordinator, but like um, one, of the, one of the issues that at stake was a conversation with a friend about having trouble with food stamps. And the problem was I had a little bit too, money, too much money in my bank account. 
I, as a human service professional, or I, as a federation professional, was not aware that the threshold was so low, that you have not much money in your account, and you, suddenly you're cut off from benefits. And so, and that's just one piece. I imagine if I keep playing, I'm going to be exposed to far more factors that I didn't know were barriers to access. So there's that also. I think it's just there's that educational piece. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to, to your example about the food bank. I think it, it, it also goes to, and what kind of food are we providing to the people who are receiving it? And is that helpful? You know, if, if you're providing rice and pasta to somebody who's homeless, that might not be as helpful as, you know, like a pre-wrapped sandwich or something of that nature. So I think it's taking the extra step to understand what the needs are and then how can we fill those gaps? All right, so I, I, I want to jump in first and thank Courtney, Mara, and Brian for really taking the time to so thoughtfully engage with this app on your phone um, and to share your perspectives. You know, this is a consciousness raising experience. This is an educational experience. This is a stigma reduction experience. Um, we're all wearing different shoes every day when we go about our lives. And um, we don't all interact with people in poverty or we don't know, perhaps we do interact with people in poverty and we don't even realize. So the point of all of this, as Dana said at the beginning is ultimately about system change. And um, I have to say, this is an engaging way to open up dialogue with all kinds of gatekeepers who can facilitate system change. And when we say system change, I think sometimes we think Washington DC, you know, major system change. What, you could do system change in your own neighborhood. You could do system change just in your family, just in dynamics of conversation. So lots of key takeaways. There were, um, I want to invite everybody, if you've got any questions, there was one question and I think you clarified this, Dana, but this is a game that multiple players could play at the same time. The board game, the board game can be played, um, of course, six characters, right. six right. people. Now the app, um, because we're in the remote environment now for educational settings, we have had a lot of creativity as for instance, Courtney demonstrated with her group, you know? Right. So you can find ways to do it but it definitely is not exactly the same as the seeing each other struggle with the same question and come up with different answers. Right, but I do think, I do think um, there are ways, the way that Courtney broke into breakout groups and then came back together to process, you could certainly do it that way. Um, and again, with the board game. Um, any other questions that people have, feel free to jump them into the, Q&A box. We are going to wrap up in a couple of minutes. Um, and, I, you know, I just want to, again, there was a question about the recording. This is being recorded. It will be distributed. Um, and the slide will be available as well. Uh, and uh, we'll have Dana's contact info if you want to be in touch with her directly for more information. And certainly if you want to be um, purchase the the actual board game itself, uh, there's a way that data can help you to do that. Um, I wanna, you know, really just close by, by thanking you all again, um, thanking Dana, especially for the creativity um, and your ability to bring a topic that we don't all like to talk about, um, but give us the structure to do it in a way that's a little bit more approachable and more comfortable. Um, and I really appreciate that. Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity for sure. And, uh, you know, let's not be afraid of having the tough conversations, you know, um, let's not be afraid of inviting virtually the poor into our decision making process. Mm -hmm. um, let's make sure that their voices are heard. And if you can't do it any other way, a game does help. Thank you. Thank you. I just think we should end with that, those last words that Dina said. So I don't wanna add much more, but thank you all for being involved. Thank you all the participants on the line that are listening in. Um, 
and this is such a beautiful way to to learn more about empathy and to create opportunities to, like you said, Dina, bring people with a lived experience into to help me you make the decision making, even if you can't have them sometimes I'm going to have people around the table with you, but to always have them in mind um, is so important. So thank you for developing a, a game and a, a way for us to to at any age or any stage or a lot of different perspectives to be able to to do that here today and and more. Um, and I want to wish everybody a, a good day, and hopefully we can continue to learn um, in the coming in the coming weeks and months together. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody.